we're very lucky to have as our featured speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Anjan Chakravarti. He grew up in Canada. Uh, he has his bachelor's in biophysics and a master's in philosophy from the University of Toronto, and then from the University of Cambridge. He has a master's in philosophy from that, as well as a PhD. More recently, a grant was made to the University of Miami uh, for a chair, and the chair in university parlance means an endowed position uh, for which there are specific funds, usually for a kind of specific purpose, a chair for the study of atheism, humanism, and secular ethics. So we're very, very pleased to have him speak to us. He's uh, very thoughtful, and I believe you're going to enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Kerry. So let's turn to the first way in which ethical and social values play a role in science. Our values influence directions of scientific research. They determine what we choose to study and investigate. And as a result, they determine what kinds of knowledge we're going to get out of science. Of course, I think once we stop to think about this for a moment, it's immediately obvious, right? There are only so many scientists, and like the rest of us, they are finite creatures. There are only so many hours in the day. And furthermore, science, as we know, is expensive. We don't have unlimited resources. So we can't study and investigate everything to the max. We have to make choices. So how are those choices made? I mean, how do we prioritize among the infinite number of things that we could actually study and investigate? Our social and ethical values determine the directions of scientific research. Right? As I just mentioned, they determine the questions we end up focusing on and thus what answers science can give us. And then as a result, they determine what tools we have when it comes to using this knowledge to act in the world. So here's an example. Uh, when I was a student, I became very interested in international development. And because a lot of the questions we end up focusing on, uh, thus being able to answer in that context, are you know, related to the medical sciences, and because a lot of my earlier studying was in the biomedical sciences, I was especially interested in what progress we'd made in the research and development spheres, right? in particular with respect to medicine, for diseases that disproportionately affect people in developing countries and the poor. Some of you will be uh, familiar with this. Right? It turns out that we spend huge, I mean, astronomical amounts of money on drugs that can be marketed to rich people in Western countries. But uh, diseases of poverty? Well, you know, not so much. Malaria, uh, tuberculosis, other tropical diseases? Right? Good luck to you. Uh, the latest drug to enhance male sexual vigor? Well, now you're talking. I don't mean to suggest that the latter is unimportant. So you might think that rationally applying our critical faculties to the realities of the sheer numbers of victims of diseases of poverty might be relevant to shaping priorities and directions of research in you know, this area, certainly, among others. But instead, what we've done is we've designed a system of funding for and profiting from this research that just doesn't incentivize working on drugs that rich people don't need. So that's an example about how we choose to distribute resources and who may benefit from science and who may not benefit from science as a result. Here's another example, which is not unconnected to these issues. Is it obvious that scientists should be able to research just whatever they want to research, so long as they can find some way of covering the costs of it? Take the long-standing tradition of research into possible cognitive differences based on factors like race and gender. To make a long story short, there's a sad history here of how some people, including scientists, have made claims about, say, uh, the intellectual inferiority of women based on cognitive factors that have been repeatedly contested, uh, revealed as bogus, and corrected. And yet, this tradition right, of research survives. And some people on the margins of science continue to make these sorts of claims which just helps to sustain these unsupported stereotypes. 
if you look at this work carefully, right, what you find is that even if it showed that there were small differences in averages right, by gender, which no one serious actually accepts, even if that were the case, the huge variation within genders is so much bigger. And so when it comes to directions of research, it's not clear that we get anything worth knowing out of this particular research program. Let me quote uh, my colleague Janet Karani here. Here's what Janet says. She says, and I quote, how much freedom do scientists really need or deserve? End quote. That's provocative. But after all, there are precedents here, right? So we bar certain forms of biomedical and genomics research because of possible worries about what would happen if the things and technologies we might create fall into the wrong hands, like terrorists or people that otherwise have no moral compass. Studies show that merely hearing racist and sexist claims, even if they're bogus, negatively affects the stereotyped populations. It's harmful to people and it perpetuates circles, uh, cycles of harm. Does this suggest that we should think carefully about what directions of research that we encourage and allow? I don't intend to answer that question today. It's actually a very tough question, right? On the one hand, we have the value of freedom of research, which is of course a very important thing. The edifice of science requires a certain amount of freedom in order for it to operate in an optimal sort of way. On the other hand, some research programs may produce claims that are not you know, only dubious, but that have negative implications for things like equality or human dignity. Now, it's not unusual in life to find that often when we're trying to decide what our best course of action is, our values conflict. All I want to point out here is that when it comes to deciding what directions to take in science, our values are part of the equation. Like it or not, they determine what questions we ask, and as a result, what answers we can have, and as a result of that, what we can actually do. I've talked a little bit about why humanists and free thinkers are and should be interested in the sciences. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the common idea that science should be value neutral, right? That is, that it should be unaffected by any uh, ethical or social concerns. And I've talked a little bit about why that isn't really a plausible way of thinking, at least when it comes to thinking about the directions of scientific work. So we have a question from Jim. You also brought up research that should be off limits. And the rationale in one case was, well, bioterrorists ter may get it. Should that stop primary research in those particular areas? You know, when we're trying to decide what sort of research we should prioritize and do, it's Certainly the case that uh, we do a lot of basic scientific research where we really don't know what the value of it will be perhaps until much, much later, right? And it's important to do that work because it's knowledge for its own sake now and knowledge for its own sake is a good thing, but maybe down the road, it will be important for some technology. On the other hand, there are some kinds of work that we do, especially in the applied sciences, where you might think, look, scientists bear some responsibility if the applications or the consequences of their work are things that they could easily foresee, and those consequences are likely bad. All right, so George? I was thinking as you were talking there that, that we earthlings or human beings were very lucky that Darwin was independently wealthy and could study any darn thing he wanted to. However, when he came up with his, his, his evolution of, of species, he was very much concerned about what people would think about it. And he, he held back for years about publishing it. What his concern was that, that people would attack him for what he believed in. And I think we're still seeing that happen today. Public opinion is a, is a very important part of the whole issue. We need to have some solutions in our society today. There's, there's no question that the, uh, the relevance of values to science that I'm talking about today is really just scratching the surface in a way. 
I mean, what I'm trying to do is illuminate various ways in which values are in fact relevant to scientific practice, um, in part because so many people think that, well, you know, if you're doing it right, then it has nothing to do with values at all. And I want to kind of um, address that as, as being something that isn't ultimately plausible after all. But if I can convince you that values are relevant in various ways, then we turn to the question that you and the, and the last questioner were really asking about, which is, so then what do we do, right? I mean, how do we act so as to bring about values that might benefit people in the right ways so that everybody is carrying their fair share of the burden, right? I mean, all of those conversations are really difficult conversations to have. Now we come back to your point about, well, it depends on what society's attitudes are, right? And I think that's absolutely right. How risk averse is our society? How willing to take on that kind of risk is our society? And then we get into the kinds of conversations that we need to have in order to decide how to act. So I don't want to suggest for a moment that this is going to be an easy thing to do, the next step, right? Sorting out all these issues. Um, yeah. But it's something that we have to do. Love it. That was fabulous.